Right, folks. Um, slide one. Uh, the Art of War. Um, if you have a look at um, Miyamoto Musashi's um, comment at the bottom, uh, fundamentally, that's what it's all about. It's about remembering what you're there to do. Um, like it says there, you're not there to parry or hit or spring. You're there to cut the enemy. You're there to defeat the enemy. Uh, and sometimes, especially in, uh, in EVE, we potentially sometimes forget that and we focus purely on the tactical fight in front of us and not actually how we go about defeating our enemy. So the point of, uh, of today's... Um, class, session, symposium, call it what you want, is for us to have a look at a couple of strategic thinkers out there um, and work out how much of their stuff, if any, is uh, is appropriate and applicable to uh, what we do in a day-to-day -day business at EVE. So before we, uh, before we dive into any of the meat of it, if you have a look at slide two, there's a little bit of information about myself. I've been in the uni approximately 18 months now. Um, of that, I spent just over a year uh, recruiting in the PO department. I've been a mentor for about 11 months, I've been teaching for three or four months, uh, and I've just been a student advisor for a couple of months as well. When I uh, first joined the uni, I, uh, I started off scouting and doing ECM for uh, noobs on patrol, and that kind of got me involved in uh, the whole uh, covert ops, black ops side of things, very in interested in that, uh, and I'm now the uh, the uni bomber uh, lead for uh, for the uni, so we take guys down into Null and we uh, we show them how to uh, fly um, stealth bombers. But why am I talking to you today uh, about the art of war and Clausewitz and Sun Tzu? Well, in my day-to-day -day job, uh, um, I currently teach um, British military officers all about leadership and warfare, and Clausewitz and Sun Tzu are two of the uh, two of the big thinkers uh, in that uh, whole philosophy of warfare element. So, was that a question there, or just an accidental keying? Right, um, like with any of my lectures, if you have a question, please feel free to ask it in lecture.e hyphen uni with the uh, with a big queue in front so I can tell and we'll go through that. Uh, and again, if you want to uh, chat in class, uh, feel free to uh, chat in class as long as we uh, respect each other and don't talk over each other. Relink the slide pack for anybody that's late. Right, um, so what are we going to have a look at? <coughs> slide three today's scope. We're going to have a quick look at what strategy is. We're going to have a look at what some of the theorists say. Um, and as I say, we'll, uh, we'll look at Clausewitz, we'll look at Sun Tzu, uh, and we'll look at some others just uh, smattered in there. Um, as I say, it's going to be highly interactive, so there's no point uh, having yourself on mute. Uh, I want you guys involved, I want you guys asking questions, and again, letting you know your thoughts and, uh, and, uh, and talking to everybody about some examples that you've, uh, you've had. Um, and if any of you have got any uh, military experience or, uh, or sort of military historian experience, please throw that in as well for, uh, for some of the, the examples and the, uh, the, the vignettes we'll uh, look at. Right, before we, uh, before we kick off, um, do we have any RVB guys in here? If you can X up in lecture. Oh, well, it's nice to see you. Right, uh, I know there's only uh, 15 of you. Uh, anybody here with any uh, military experience or um, uh, military historian uh, or has read any Sun Tzu or Clausewitz. Excellent, so that's a little bit out there. Right, and obviously folks, you have to remember that uh, now that uh, Silas uh, can join in one of our events, uh, you're not allowed to primary him for the next 24 hours. Uh, unless he's in a shiny ship. Or, or a cheap frigate. Right, so uh, having a quick look at um, slide 4, um, fundamentally strategy is very simple. Um, it, it evolves around uh, three uh, three layers. Uh, there's the strategic layer, the operational layer, and the tactical layer. And, and, and what we tend to do in EVE is we tend to focus on the tactical layer. We tend to focus on um, the actual fighting, um, getting two fleets, getting two gangs, um, even if it's just finding a miner uh, and throwing a bomb and torps at them in, in null sec. It's all about the tactical fight. However, what you have to do, um, if you're actually looking at the art of war and going to win a war, you have to look at what your strategic objectives are. And like it says there, it's the end ways means. Well, what are we trying to do? Where are we trying to get to? So, from a uni perspective, um, by the end of this war, what, what, what do you think we want to achieve? What's, what's ASMO's strategic goal? Fun. Okay, fun. Anything else? Being is positive. Okay. Drive being up the is price of T1 frigates. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, Walrus Cancer there's got uh, learning, yep, yeah, so we learn from it. Sileth is the, uh, is the only RVB uh, rep here. What, what, what about RVB? What, what's their strategic objective? Just to have fun. Yeah, again, fundamentally the same kind of stuff. Just to have fun. And we'll, uh, we'll talk about that later on, because having fun 
uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have a look when we look at some of Sun Tzu's stuff to see if we're actually having fun in the most effective way we can have fun. Yeah, Damocles says a bit of PvP experience. So, um, we've got the strategic level, which uh, which we believe from our uh, our CEOs is to go out there and have fun. Um, what, what's, uh, what's our objective at the tactical level? To blow up ships. Okay, we want to blow up ships. Anything else? Okay, Walrus wants to be ISK positive. Faye, do you, do you want to save the pause? Is that your tactical objective? Yes, because I protect this pause almost three years now. Okay, so see again. So that's not important to some people, but it's very important to Faye because he's been protecting the pause. Um, we, we lost it last time, so it must all be your fault. Maybe. Okay. Um, Caden wants to kill a lot of things. Damocles wants to uh, wants to win engagements efficiently. Um, uh, how do you how do you mean win efficiently? Yeah, noob fleets can be a bit bit uh, a bit chaotic, and with a bit of uh, with a bit of planning, uh, we can uh, we can be a bit more efficient in the way we do things. So if we've got all these different perspectives, because like we say, there's people wanting to uh, protect the pause, uh, people wanting to learn, people want to get experience, people want to be ISK positive. Everybody at the tactical level is wanting to do different things. So who do we have in the uni, and, and um, from Silas' perspective, who is there in RVB that turns around and takes the strategic objective of the CEO and ties that into the tactical aims of the individual pilot? Okay, Walrus thinks it's the FCs. Oh, and again, the other thing is, I'm not going to give you any answers in here. This is all, uh, if anything, I'm going to give you more questions than answers by the end of this. Okay, so just FCs, no no other uh, advance on that. Okay, do the FCs know what you want? Okay, Theo says it's the leadership organisation as a whole. Does the leadership know what you want, Theo? Probably not. I mean, they can assume or guess. Okay, possibly not. They can assume, yep. So potentially... It sounds like we, we, we're, we're probably missing that operational level guidance. The, the, the person in between who connects the tactical resources to the strategic objectives. The FC generally tends to meet the strategic objectives or their own tactical aims. You know, if an FC takes a fleet out to defend the paws, it doesn't matter if you want to defend the paws or if Faye decides that, you know, he doesn't want to defend the paws anymore. If that's what the FC is doing, that's what you do. So potentially within EVE, we don't always have that link between the strategic objective and what the individual FC wants to do. Prime example, um, I took, um, as you may be aware, I took Unibombers out on day one of the war, um, and we were looking at the strategic objective of how do we defeat RVB. It wasn't about having fun. Well, there was that as well. Uh, but it wasn't about being as positive. It was about how do we do something that will affect RVB and potentially make the war difficult for them to continue doing. So we started hitting the pauses. Um, now, obviously, that didn't tie in with the strategic objectives of uh, of ASMO, and we were told quickly, look, we're not hitting pauses anymore. That's not part of our war plan. So, again, it's what we looked at as, as what we believe to be the strategic objectives. Uh, wasn't necessarily what uh, the CEO um, saw as the strategic objectives. So it's that link between the people actually doing the blowing up and the people actually coming up with the plan that we possibly, in EVE, don't necessarily have. Is that a fair assumption, or do people disagree? Is everybody still awake out there? Uh, yes. Excellent, just checking. So for the operational stuff, uh, within the ILN there was uh, discussions about uh, fleets we could set up uh, when Red vs. Blue wanted to do this or came up with that fleet with what we countered as. So there was planning uh, from the ILN side uh, for this war. Yeah, again, uh, and, and, and that's, that, that's really interesting because you said there has been planning happening, but then as Damocles says, um, doesn't necessarily understand where ASMO wants to go with this war. We've had a really good couple of emails from Frood, um, and I don't know what uh, the comms is like in uh, in RVB, uh, Silas, but actually, do you know exactly what your uh, your CEOs want? Or are you just Not assuming? Exactly. No. So again, there's that. And interestingly enough, this is something that's come up in every time I've run this is there's not necessarily that good comms between the strategic level from the CEOs uh, and the directors and the actual uh, end user. Um, and I'm actually going to pass all the feedback on to ASMO to say, look, just to let you know, this is the general feeling from, uh, from grassroots as to uh, where we could be potentially doing better in the future.
So we've discussed that uh, we've discussed that uh, strategy is really simple. It's all about the ends, ways, means, uh, the strategic direction at the top, the operational level plans, putting everything together, and the tactical level blowing stuff up. However, um, it's not actually simple. Have a look at slide five, and that kind of ties into the the things we've been talking about. You know, you, you look there and go, well, actually, what is the strategic objective? Um, is it achievable? When uh, when we went into uh, Sorry, was that someone's question? Nope, just a dodgy key. Uh, when we went into Afghanistan, uh, what was our strategic or political objective? To be Taliban. Okay, remove the Taliban. Any advance on that? Okay, to appear... Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting one there. To appear effective against a perceived threat? Yeah, definitely. Um, because perception is, uh, is just as important as reality. So we were in there because we had to do something. Anything else? Yep, stopping terrorism, the war on terror. Okay, how do you win the war on terror? Kill the population, okay. entire population. Yeah, kill everybody. you asking too deep questions, you know. Oh yeah, no, I know they're deep questions. These are supposed to be deep questions. Um, so again, if you go into a country like Afghanistan and go, how are we... Oh, sorry, I've got... I've got the, the puppy in the background. Um, if you go into Afghanistan and and uh, and your political objectives, are, like say, are ambitious um, and potentially unachievable, how do you achieve victory? Yeah, uh, no more terror. Well, what is terrorism? Terrorism is somebody trying to get their way uh, and, and believing that uh, military force is the only way to do it, or or non-legitimate military force is is the only way to do this. So as long as you have a difference of opinion, you always have the potential for terrorism. Yeah, appeasement, potentially. And again, you look at the third point there. How do you set an unpopular strategy if you want to be re-elected in a few days? In in, in, uh, in the UK, um, when there was the vote on uh, on going into uh, into Syria, um, there, there is a belief that actually David Cameron, the Prime Minister, called for the vote uh, early, knowing he was going to fail it, because he didn't want to go in, because if he'd gone in, that would have been unpopular. But he made it look democratic by going, look, we're having a vote on it. Oh dear, I've lost. What a shame. So again, when are people going to uh, follow a strategy that they know will get them into trouble? You know, if, uh, if um, ASMO or uh, the RVB management had uh, said, you know what, actually in this war we're just giving everything up, we're going to let them burn it and we're going to, uh, we're going to disappear off. Um, would, the, uh, would the members of the, uh, the relevant corporations have been happy? No, probably not. Yeah, probably not. So again, um, there's an element of, well actually, not only do I have to think about where I wish to take my organisation, my country, my nation, whatever, I actually have to think about the people as well, because if they don't want to go then the decisions I make to take them in that direction are going to cause problems. Uh, um, other organizations having different needs, wants, and expectations. Ha ha Sorry, okay, it's very difficult to... to uh, can you can you lot hear the puppy in the background? Yes. Right. Um, how, how difficult would this be for uh, RVB to fight the war if Blue and Red wanted to go in different directions and had different opinions uh, as to what to do? We're going around circles. We're getting nothing done. Yeah, exactly. Um, when you look at the, uh, the 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 Balkans war um, in in Kosovo, there was a uh, a big Serbian um, communications hub that would have had a massive impact on the uh, on the conflict if it had been taken out. But the Dutch turned around and went, "Look, you can't this uh, this target out. There is a Dutch masterpiece hanging on the wall, and that's part of our cultural heritage." So again, everybody different cultures different organisations, they've got different needs, different wants, as they, they expect to get out of it. And you have to balance all this when you're working with different people. You know, um, then you look at the stuff at the bottom, you know, we, we, we overconfidence in what we can do. Um, and again, going back to uh, Afghanistan, look, the, those are those are farmers with $50 of AK, uh, AKs um, up, up against the, uh, the might of the West. We'll, uh, we'll have them defeated in no time because aren't we awesome? Well, actually, that hasn't worked. Uh, we underestimate their capabilities. We underestimate their willpower. Um, uh, you know, we, we we fail to think about the situation. How many times in this war have you been out in a fleet where you've been a little bit nervous, going, "Oh, I don't really know what I'm doing," here, and and the opponents haven't fought you because they've perceived that your threat is actually greater than it is. Anybody here flown a crow? Nobody. Right. Okay. Um, first time I flew a crow, I noticed people in local behave differently. I didn't have a clue what I was doing, but they saw the crow and they went, ah, right, it's a crow, I'm avoiding it. 
So again, it's that perception, it's that influence that you can have without actually having to do anything. And in fact, if you look at the boards at the moment, um, whether it's on Twitter or um, there's, there's loads of discussion about um, AFK cloaky ships and the effect that uh, an AFK cloaky ship can have um, is disproportionate to actually it uncloaking and, uh, and providing any combat influence. Okay, interesting one from Theo for a war that's supposedly about learning with surprisingly little teaching going on. What do people think about that one? Do people agree? Or not, do they think? not everyone learns the same way, though. So it depends on what your definition of teaching is. I've learned quite a bit just by being in the fleet and listening to the essays and the opinions of other people. Okay. Yeah, sure. But in my experience, we go out, except who has a, who has a lodgy, and nobody asks you if you've ever flown that lodge before, except if you have a, a tackling freak. I have absolutely still have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. That tackling freak. Nobody's mentioned it. Turn off your, um, well, w- what to do with your um, speed once you approach the enemy. I just fly by the target, stuff like that. So, yeah, we have. Classes on strategy, which is wonderful, but I would much rather have someone teach me how to fly my fucking Atron. Sorry about the language. Yeah, no, that's that, that's true. And when you look at some of the comments in there, uh, you know, taken by example, um, the fact that as Caden says, you know what, when you find an FC that that learns uh, and teaches and develops his uh, his his or her fleet, uh, they're the ones that you want to go out with uh, on 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 a regular uh, on a regular basis. And yeah, it's that issue of you know what, everybody learns differently so and again that's something I'll feed back to uh, Asmo but what we should see is certainly after the war there'll be a number of uh, um, after act reports that we can hopefully all kind of read and learn from but as you say um, sometimes it's your responsibility to say to the FC look just to let you know I don't know what I'm doing here could somebody give me uh, a little bit of a heads up because um, as an FC they've probably got a lot on their plate and they probably haven't even thought of that sometimes but yeah maybe we could do that better sure I will so, right, we're half an hour into the session and we haven't really even started yet. So, slide six, let's talk about Clausewitz. So, what do we have? Um, he was Prussian, uh, he joined the army at the age of 12, um, died um, of cholera um, much later uh, as a major general, so he did fairly well for himself, um, but throughout his uh, his career he wrote this book uh, on war. Well, it was, it was eight separate volumes. Um, it wasn't finished at the time of his death. His wife kind of um, tidied it up, finished it off, and then uh, and then got it published. Has anybody actually looked at uh, On War, or uh, or actually even worse, been forced to read it? It's it's a very difficult read. The language isn't particularly easy to understand, and it, it's written in a in, in a very flowery manner. However, he was one of the first people um, in uh, in Western Europe to to put some thought to the philosophy of war rather than the how you line men up and uh, and slaughter them uh, with other men. So slide seven, what does he do? Well, he talks about what, what, what the kind of things he believes that war is uh, and war isn't. Um, and as I say, before that point, people had basically tried to identify, here is the optimum way of doing it. You have this number of cavalry in that position, you have that number of infantry in that position, and if you do the following three things, you will defeat your opponent. He was the first person to go, you know what, it's, it's more complicated than that. Uh, you've got people involved, you've got uh, training involved, you've got the environment involved, you've got knowledge involved. It's not just about lining your teams up, it's not a game of chess um, there's more to it than that um, so there's no way that you can guarantee that you're going to win by uh, by following a set plan you know, um, but he he, he he basically focused on the fact that uh, it's not about um, statistics, it's not about numbers um, it's about something deeper than that um, for example you look at uh, America in the, the Vietnam War, uh, the the American government and the military they became obsessed with uh, with the statistics, with this finding the ultimate um, tactic that you have to do to win. Uh, they tried to computerize everything, so the numbers uh, were all fed into the Rand computers, and the Rand Corporation went, "Yeah, this is what you now need to do to win the war. Uh, you need to do X, Y, Z based on numbers." Um, so, because statistics and numbers became important. Uh, then the individuals on the ground were reporting statistics and numbers because that was what was important to them um, because that's what they were getting assessed on. So um, kill numbers became overinflated. Your body count became overinflated. If you blew up a 45-gallon oil drum, you didn't report it as, I've blown up a 45-gallon oil drum, I've blown up an enemy fuel compound. 
So all these things became overinflated. So the information going up to the leaders and going up to the computers uh, and the Rand Corporation, they were all they were all rubbish and meaningless uh, because they driven statistics. And you can see the the effect that has in uh, in day to day life at the moment when uh, when schools are all driven by statistics. Um, health services are all driven by statistics. So because statistics is a measure of, of their success, then they focus on achieving those statistics, potentially at the loss of their actual core output. And someone's linked some uh, books from the Mitanni. So he talked about warfare being uh, more of an art than a science. So if you have a look at slide 8, there's a little bit of information there. And he talks about doctrine, he talks about the theory of war. He talks about that the, uh, doctrine is uh, is there for the commanders to understand, but not follow um, slavishly. When the Soviets went into Afghanistan, their aim in Afghanistan was to stabilize the country, um, and they went, well, we could control the cities. So they moved into the cities, and their intent was to free up the Afghan National Army to go out into the hills and the mountains and do the fighting. Um, that didn't happen because when they got there, the Afghan National Army was, was woefully in, in, inadequate and underprepared for it. So the Soviets then had to go uh, into the countryside. But their training had been for Cold War in Western Europe. So they went in there um, with the equipment and with the training and with the mindset that we're doing uh, mass tank warfare uh, in the plains of Western Europe. Uh, and surprisingly enough, they took a good kick in. Um, why we then went in with exactly the same perspective um, much later uh, and didn't learn from them is completely beyond me. It took us a good two years before we started to learn the lessons that they'd already learned. Oh, I see we've already lost a couple of people out of, uh, out of the class. Am I keeping you all awake? Yes, you completely okay. It's very interesting. Excellent. Um, so again, but then fundamentally, like Douglas Bader says at the end, um, rules are for the obedience of fools and the guidance of wise men. If you take a doctrine fleet out and that's not the fight that you want to see, or uh, or you need to use it differently, use it differently. It's not there just to be used in that way. If you can see another way of achieving your overall aim uh, by changing the tactics for the situation, then go ahead. So what was he saying about war? Well, Clausewitz, uh, when he's talking about war, uh, details are on slide 9. He says that war fundamentally is a continuation of politics uh, by other means. Slightly different in the EVE environment because we're, we're there to actually um, do PvP. Um, so the politics there are slightly different. Um, but fundamentally, he's saying in the big wide world, you know what, if you can't do things politically through diplomatic means, uh, you may have to resort to uh, uh, warfare. And, and uh, Clausewitz said there were three key things to, uh, to making warfare effective. And you need to have the balance between the rational plans of the government, uh, the ends and means of the military, and, and the people that were voting the government in. Um, and if you didn't have a balance between the government, the military, and the people, uh, your war was doomed to failure. And especially nowadays, when you look at the impact that the media can have on, on a military campaign, if, uh, if you don't have the people supporting what the military's doing, and the military supporting the government, things can fall apart very, very quickly. But he also said, you know what, war isn't any different from a duel. It's two people fighting, or two or more people. Um, but unlike a duel, there are less rules. Uh, the violence can be a lot more horrific and a lot more intense. Uh, and, uh, and unlike a duel, where, uh, where you may be fighting to first blood, in, uh, in war, you're, uh, you're fighting to total destruction of the, uh, of the enemy. And he was the one that was looking at this as, as an art form, as I said, rather than, uh, rather than um, um, just, just merely warfare. But how does this change nowadays? You've got uh, weapons of mass destruction out there. Um, politics influences this. Um, you know, we can use insurgent tactics against uh, first world militaries. Um, the media, globalization. How, how does all this fit in, do people think? I have no idea. Okay. Fit into what, sorry? Got distracted well, there. Yeah, no, fit into the whole the whole warfare thing, the whole Clausewitz's thing about it being a duel um, and, and that you're there to destroy your opponent. Well, it's obviously rarely the case, I believe. Yeah, I, I mean, guess. It, sorry, go ahead. No, no, not for you. Uh, I guess that the media influence is very big on uh, warfare nowadays because they can completely stop the war by acting against it or they can completely support the war uh, by supporting it and uh, what are the goals of the government uh, to reach this so uh, you have 
to keep that in into your uh, strategies. And this was part was done uh, by the Americans in the first Gulf War, where they are completely controlling uh, what was uh, delivered on pictures uh, by the media because they completely controlled it. What they didn't done in Afghanistan, for example, uh, what they didn't done in Vietnam, for example. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the uh, the media is, is is a key element to to get your message across, uh, to get your influence across, um, and actually, um, potentially, that's something that we could look at in Eve of using social media. Um, we can use the the, uh, the the websites that are out there, Twitter, Facebook. So actually, you can influence your opponent potentially uh, through the media in uh, in what we do. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at um, four things that Clausewitz thought were uh, were really important. If you have a look at slide 10, one of the first things he came up with was uh, selection and maintenance of the aim. I'll let you have a read of that. So again, um, what's, the, uh, what's the aim of this war? Learn and have fun. Okay, learn and have fun. So uh, how, how do we know if we've won? We have much bigger number of uh, unistas who take part in war and maybe learn something so we can uh, somehow do... Uh, quiz about it, uh, what people learn, and how do they uh, think they achieve some of their learning goals. And having fun, I take as roughly equal number of losses uh, on both sides without any big difference, because it means that somebody lost more than other side. Okay, so it's it's about having fun. It's about thinking about what we've done and developing and learning. Um, uh, and interestingly enough, Faye seems to suggest there that actually we only win this war if we don't actually physically defeat RVB significantly. You know, so to win it, we have to all benefit from it. Um, and I think it's uh, very very important because uh, you know I take this not as a uh, as a uh, last year. Uh, struggle to eliminate some objects, as I previously mentioned, our post. So uh, the um, uh, animosity was very high, and I think we lost uh, the main thing in, in a war in if that you still war over some pixels. And you come out of your computer, and uh, the ability to, uh, uh, I better say, respect each other must stay uh, on the same level. And yeah. this war is very good example of this when our very gentlemen bring us fight, even uh, when they almost every fight outnumbers. So uh, it gives them my big respect because uh, they do not uh, sit on a station uh, and play uh, on dog games with us and they keep local with uh, respected and uh, good high spirit uh, competition than just uh, bringing stuff on uh, on heads of young unistas. Yeah, so we, uh, we we win by everybody having fun, like like uh, like uh, Faye saying. Um, Silas, how, how do you know that RVB have won? Pretty much locking down Aldra, and then once the morale's broken off, um, if you're in a university, take out your symbol, which is the POS. Yeah, but again, we'll just we'll just put it back. But then, interestingly enough, then red goes back to fighting blue, blue goes back to fighting red. So uh, my 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 thing there is, and actually, we'll we'll talk about that in in uh, in a second. Actually, uh, we, we'll have a bit of a chat about that. But yeah, um, like we see, we we've had some really good fights here, and actually, um, the, the win is that we all go away uh, learning from it and still having that 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 uh, that level of respect. Um, and understanding. Uh, one of the things that I'm thinking about at the moment is with the CSM9 elections, you look at people, there's an awful lot of block voting. Oh, well, that guy's in my corporation, so uh, on my alliance, so I'm going to vote for them, or that person supports wormhole uh, space, so I'm going to vote for them because that's what I'm interested in. Well, actually, um, when you look at the uh, the list, there's a couple of real dicks on that list that I don't care what they're uh, um, interested in. I don't care if they're going to represent the bit of the game that, that, that I like, is that the, the individuals are, I've got no respect for, so I, I won't vote for them. Um, and this idea that actually it doesn't matter what you do in this sandbox game, if, if you tweak wormholes, it has an effect 
on every other element of the game and I think people tend to forget that what they want is you know I want you to make my bit of the game better well if you make your bit of the game better you probably make somebody else's bit worse Spanky I'm sorry but I little tinfoil had it so you actually say that right now because Mangala salaries are part of new uh, stellar console management uh, so he put break on this war and uh Uh, puts in order that only uh, gentlemen of RVB to make it higher and maybe more interested in uh, so voting for Mangala to CSM. I- I'm not saying that at all, uh, no. But, actually, that would be potentially uh, a, a, sensible, uh, a sensible thing to go. From a political perspective, at the moment, uh, Mangala's on, on my list because I've chatted to him a couple of times and actually seems like a nice bloke. Yes, and, uh, you know, uh, it's it's very unexpected information that a guy is publishing a blog so that when they meet with Mangala uh, in, in, in real life, he is very, like, high-spirited and uh, gentle. Uh, and uh, I, I quote the blog much more interested in others than in himself. Yeah, but that's interesting, you know. Uh, actually, you could almost say, I don't know if the war's been timed well, because actually, I imagine that he's going to get a number of Unista votes because of, of what we've seen in the uh, in the war. You're absolutely right. And Leto talks about there a little bit of pride, because, yeah, you want the uni to be on the positive side. Yeah, you want to be uh, um, it's positive, or or at least not hideously negative. So, um, we've looked at selection and maintenance of the aim, let's move on to uh, slide 11 and, uh, and concentration of force. That's, that's been, uh, been an interesting one, is uh, where, do you, uh, where do you stick all your troops? Um, the uni at the moment seems to be doing relatively well because we seem to be um, throwing some very big fleets out when I've, when I've certainly been on. Um, I, I've noticed that um, uh, the RVB fleets tend to, like somebody else said, tends to have been um, quite a bit smaller than ours uh, in uh, in some cases um, I, might, I, I don't know um, uh, why that is, Silas might have a, a better view but um, from what I understand RVB's got much more in the way of numbers so uh, so we'd be expecting to see some bigger fleets around here Most of our players are weekend warriors and AFKs and whatnot. Um, yeah, looking at red right now we have 10 people logged in so it really does depend on what time of day it is Right. Well, we've actually, we've only got 70-odd Unistas, but yeah, still 7 to 1. So again, it's all about concentrating your force. It's all about keeping all your uh, your uh, your numbers nice and high and actually being able to do something uh, something effective. Uh, but then again, in EVE, you know exactly what it's like. All it takes is one ship in the right place at the right time, and you can be massively effective. You don't have to potentially concentrate your force as much. But fundamentally, like he's saying, you know what, if you have an equal number of troops and your opponents around you, Actually, traditional thinking would say, well, that the, the, the surrounding troops are the, uh, are the most powerful. But as, as Clausewitz is saying, well, no, they're the weakest ones because they've got no depth. There's lots of them spread out thinly, whereas you are all in one big blob and you have massive effect wherever you choose. So, number 12, let's have a look at that center of gravity. Um, basically, what he was saying was, if you have a look and understand your opponent, you will identify what their center of gravity is. The one element that if you hit, it will have a disproportionate effect and uh, and potentially win the war. So, um, Sileth, come on then, what's uh, what's the uh, E-Uni centre of gravity, do you think? I'm um, not really sure. Uh, the FCs, I guess. Take out the FCs and you guys will just not have any coordination. Yeah, potentially taking out our FCs. What about, uh, what about the rest of the guys? And uh, granted, we shouldn't be telling the enemy our secrets, but what do you lot think the uh, centre of gravity is of the uni? It's yes. Okay, old rat. Potentially from phase perspective, obviously the pause. If we lose the pause, do we lose the war? Nope. No, we don't lose the war, but uh, as a uh, uh, gentleman from RVB previously stated, it's a symbol of our pride as they take, and... Maybe it's some sort of our flank, so... But you're absolutely right. We just pay uh, 500 bill, uh, mils more, and I think that it's pretty easy number for our wallets to put another one and wait one more year. Yeah, and as, as Lito says, you know, 
uh, no, we might not lose the war if we lose the pause, but we might feel like it. So again, it's that idea that potentially it's a symbol. Um, you know, and I think this war is different to the last war because the last war we almost felt the pause was given away. Yes, and I really uh, was sad that we have only one. I don't um, leadership for the war for the uh, previous war only in last moment, and uh, as I remember, a year uh, 2011, a year when we have Jacks. It was much more hyped and much more high spirit and very well informed and regularly informed to every Unistas what we're doing, what our plans and what we uh, are expected to do. So uh, I prefer old war to the previous one. So uh, looking at this, when you look at the uh, the, the war with RVB compared with the war with uh, Pursuit of Happiness, um, and generally the war with UMAD. Um, what's the difference in feeling it has on the uni, do you think? To me, it feels more serious. Like, it feels like we're actually, you know, like, like RVB is a, a realistic threat versus some of the other corps that we've been at war with. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, um, our RVB are a more realistic threat. They bring, they bring better fights. But actually, has it, has it, we're, we're fighting a massive corporation now. Um, has that made morale plummet compared with when we get decked by UMAD? You mentioned it really good because, you know, uh, with RVB, at least we can show them anything. We can show them numbers. We can show uh, them a few uh, experienced FCs. And to, uh, in war of you with UMADs, uh, we just uh, take, take a pokes and do nothing because they... Uh, we do not have sides that can show them anything besides our suicide dances and tornadoes. Yeah, so again, it's very much like, um, you know, when you're fighting RVB, it's conventional warfare, it's what we know, it's what we understand. When you're fighting people like you, Mad, um, they are more uh, using insurgent tactics. It's hit and run, there's not much you can do about it. And potentially, it's a lot more demoralizing to the uni than actually good fights with uh, with RVB or any other large corporation. But we take it, uh, we take it pretty okay because we understand that, uh, and it's very good supported by, by our forum so that we will always have some dirt on our boots and it's just dirt, dirt. Yeah. Right. So finally, the, uh, the, the last of the four points that I want to talk about from Clausewitz from, um, is all about a- attacking. Uh, so have a look at slide 13, have a quick read about that. Yeah, Damocles' point there, the UMAD war, it's all about minimising losses. But the issue is the UMAD war actually drove people away from the uni because people just didn't want to play anymore uh, because UMAD were spoiling their fun. Whereas actually, the RVB war has made people drop other corporations and come and join the uni because they know it's going to be fun. Yeah, we're getting some ringers in, Sila. Sorry, what was that? Yeah, as I'm saying, we're, re- we're recruiting all the good PVPers from around the... Uh, uh, from round the uh, round the globe to uh, to help us fight. Yeah, I've noticed uh, Talon is uh, part of your group now. So what was close of it saying? He was saying, look, it's easy to defend because you're on home ground. Uh, you know the environment. You don't have short supply lines. But fundamentally, defending does not win. Defending does not uh, beat your opponent. And like uh, like Damocles says, you know what? The UMAD war is all about minimizing losses. That's being defensive. When you're defensive, you can't win a war. You might be able to not lose it, but you can't win. You need to attack to win. And what Clausewitz was saying, if you ever read there, you know what, it's about cutting off your opponent's uh, line of retreat. Interestingly enough, completely different to Sun Tzu's perspective, um, because uh, Clausewitz was all about destroying the enemy, whereas Sun Tzu was actually, I don't care if I destroy you or not, I just want you to stop fighting. If I stop you fighting, I've won. Um, if I can defeat you, I've won. So I don't need to, do, to surround you and destroy you. If I can leave you an escape route and you can go away, then uh, then at the moment, that's great. Uh, but fundamentally, it's all about, like he says, it's all about concentration of forces. Use your forces effectively and uh, and attack. So slide 14, what, what can we take away from uh, from Clausewitz's perspective? Because I'm conscious of the time here. Um, selection and maintenance of the aim we've talked about. We've talked about uh, using your forces in, uh, in, uh, in big groups. Um, on using them effectively, identifying what your opponent's centre of gravity is. Uh, interestingly enough, one of the big uh, things that comes out of the discussion that people say the uni centre of gravity is, is the students. Um, if we don't have people wanting to join uh, EVE Uni uh, to learn, uh, EVE Uni ceases to exist. So actually, if as an opponent you can do something that stops 
Unistas joining or forces them to leave the uni, uh, you've defeated us. It's all about attack, um, and it's all about this ends, ways and means, strategic, operational and tactical level. Right, having a quick look at Sun Tzu. Now, there is some debate as to whether or not um, he actually existed as an individual, but uh, let's work on the theory that uh, that he did, um, because then it makes everything else easier. Uh, like it says there, uh, born in about 544 BC, died in about 496 um, and he was one of the key strategic thinkers in the uh, 6th century BC. Uh, has anybody here read The uh, the Art of War? Okay, Eisner has. It's actually not a bad book. I mean, if you're going to uh, if you're going to read the two, uh, I'd definitely read Art of War compared with uh, On War. Um, it's a relatively easy read. It uses relatively simple language. And yeah, as Reisner says, if you can find a decent translation, um, ideally translated by somebody that speaks uh, that, that, that's a natural Chinese speaker, uh, because they can get the inflection and the meaning behind the words in the translation, as opposed to just understanding what the words are. Um, it's based on Taoist thinking, so it was very philosophical, um, and uh, and it's used by everybody. Like it says there, business, politics, military, sport, they all use some of the concepts from the art of war um, because the philosophical thinking was, was so simple that it's still effective today. So what was he saying? Um, what were his thoughts on strategy? If you have a quick look at slide 17, he was saying it's all about preparing for your opponent, making them angry, making them confused. Um, so... Uh, how does that tie into uh, not being able to smack talk war targets? Because Sun Tzu said that's a really good thing if you can upset your opponent. You are denying them tears. Yeah, you do. Um, especially when it comes to groups like uh, like you, Mad, who are there to frustrate you. If if they see you not getting frustrated, um, potentially that could be what's angering them. Keeping your opponent under pressure. Um, and then there's the quote there from uh, uh, Colonel John Boyd. Um, have a quick read about that. He's basically saying it's all about being able to do things faster than our opponent, being able to change faster. Um, and he came up with uh, what in the military is known as the OODA loop. Um, observe, orient, or orientate, uh, decide, and then act. If you can do that faster than your opponent, they will always be on the defensive. They'll always be reacting to what you're doing, by which stage you've already moved on and you're doing something else. Um, it's all about changing speed and direction faster than your opponent. Now, we know that in game being able to change speed and direction is important, but he was actually talking about speed and direction of your behavior and your thinking. Um, you need to be able to think and act faster than your opponent. You need to keep them reacting, keep a step ahead of them, um, so that when they start reacting to what you've done, uh, you've already moved on and their reaction is, isn't, any, uh, isn't any use. It's about you know short-circuiting their plans, forcing them to make those mistakes. And in fact, it was uh, it was John Boyd that led to the uh, the design of the uh, the F-16 uh, and the uh, the F-18, because up till then the uh, the American aircraft tended to have been bigger and heavier. And he was going, well, actually, no, it's not about being bigger or heavier. It's about being able to get into the right position uh, and uh, and defeat your opponent through uh, through speed uh, and efficiency. You know, find out what binds your opponent's troops together and do what you need to to break those bonds. Um, that's one of the reasons that, uh, uh, you know, if we, uh, as, as the uni, could do something that creates friction between red and blue during this war, they're potentially not going to be focused on us. They're going to be going, well, actually, this war where the uni's finished, we've still got to fight each other, and now that side's got a massive advantage. So, again, it's identifying what we can do to influence your opponent, and not necessarily just think, how am I going to influence in the fight, but how am I going to influence in the, in the long term? A quick question, if I may. Of course. Um, every state must have a, a war doctrine. Um, do we have a dedicated organization within the uni that, um, well, worry, well, functions as a military? Do we have a standing military arm? Well, yeah, yes and no. We have ILN. the uh, we have the the Ivy League Navy, the the, the ILN. Um, my only issue with the ILN is they do everything behind closed doors. Uh, the point with the ILN nowadays is that it's a little bit more about a think tank. So what we can do on strategies and so on, most of the stuff that goes, let's say, with active PvP is more focused currently on the different uh, campuses we have and in the end of the FCs that are leading the fleets. So the ILN nowadays is not like a standing military. It was uh, the way when I joined University some years ago that we have an 
military arm that was doing actively PvP, uh, but nowadays the ILN is more of a think tank. Understood. So the ILN comes up with the, the, the doctrines and theories, passes them on to, um, I'm guessing, some of the FCs, probably the ILN FCs. Uh, I don't know if they pass them on to uh, all FCs, but that's that's the kind of thinking that comes out in uh, in Froude's Eve mails about what's happening in the war uh, has been kind of led by the ILN thinking. Because that's, that's one of the um, little things I found surprising when we, um, well, we were told that RVB is going to be coming our way, how much time it took us to formulate our doctrines, which led to problems with logistics. And I was surprised because, well, this had happened before. Uh, yeah. Um, can we just park that for another two or three slides and then we'll talk, we'll come, we'll come back to that? Of course. Thank you. So, um, one of the things we've said potentially is that, that we don't necessarily have as many links uh, between the uh, the CEO, the sort of upper level management, and the individual thing. So, so having a look at leadership on slide 18, what did Sun Tzu say that leaders needed? Well, um, fundamentally, uh, if your fight goes on for longer, you're going to run out of uh, resources. Uh, we all know that uh, at the moment, resources buying ships uh, around Old Rat and, uh, and the ammo you want isn't always easy, and the fittings and the rigs, because they've all kind of gone, so the resources are being depleted. Um, so, like he says, it's, it's not about fighting long, it's about fighting effectively. So, uh, he talks about a leader knowing when to fight and when not to fight. Uh, how many of you have been in fleets where at the end of the fleet uh, you've had a quiet night, and there's not been much, and the FC has thrown you against something that you know is going to kill you, just because you've had nothing else to do? Only me then. It happens sometime. Okay, so again, uh, yeah, there you go, loads, okay, now it's coming out there, loads of time. Meant as a learning experience, okay, yeah, um, uh, d does everybody think it's a learning experience? Okay, potentially yes, potentially no, so again, um, some people think it is, some people think it's not, some people think it's fun, um, I, I turn around and go, you know what, if I, if I jump into a fight and die within the first three seconds, have I learned anything? Probably not. Um, so, so again... Everybody in the fleet potentially has different perspectives and different opinions. So, so one of the uh, one of the uh, one of the things I would say is when it comes to you uh, to be out there FCing a fleet, have a think about what you're doing uh, and work out what you're going to do. And if you're going to throw your fleet against something that's going to help them, uh, make sure it's for uh, fun that everybody's interested in, or everybody's going to learn from it, rather than you know what I'm bored, let's just kill the fleet. Uh, because everybody in your fleet may not have the same opinion of uh, of throwing yourself into that fight as uh, as you. You do. Yeah, and again, as Theo says, in the uni, it does you the favour of teaching you uh, about loss, which uh, which we generally know all too well. Uh, right, what else does he say about a leader? He says, you know what, a leader's going to be successful um, if all his troops are united in purpose. So, interestingly enough, um, at the start, I, I did turn around and go, uh, what's our uh, what's our key aim here? And we all came up with different key aims. So, so if we all want different things out of the war, how does a leader... Uh, manage to keep us all together and unite us in purpose? And that's just a sort of rhetorical question. Or maybe you could answer it. Okay, as Damocles says, yeah, communicate the purpose very well. How many times have you joined a fleet where actually the FC has gone, right, the aim of this fleet is to do X, Y, Z? Or do you just join a fleet, bring what you can, and uh, and go and fight? Okay, as Reisner says, uh, find a purpose that they want to, uh, and ask like-minded people, yeah, coalition of the willing. So again, it's that communication, it's getting that idea across, it's bringing people with you that want to do what uh, what you want to do. However, on slide 19, um, he came up with a few things that he thought uh, uh, was very bad for uh, leaders to display. Reckless with troops, uh, not taking appropriate fights, um, unable to control their emotions, uh, a weak sense of honour, basically what he was talking about there was, and that ties into the uh, the unable to control their emotions. Um, if if somebody can insult you and drive you into behaviour that you wouldn't have done otherwise, that's a display of, uh, of weakness. And potentially being too compassionate. And what about compassionate? Because I <laughs> don't get it. Don't get the idea. If you okay. take somebody's losses too close and it stops you from acting, yeah. All right. How, how about uh, uh, you get uh, you get scrammed and webbed, uh, and you're getting burnt down? Um, do you want the FC to go right? You know what? If I jump the fleet in there, we're going to lose you know a lot more ships. Or uh, so do I come and save uh, Faye, or do I just let Faye die and save my fleet? I see. Mm -hmm. You would obviously want the fleet to come and get you. Yes, and especially when I'm loading. <laughs> so yeah, especially when you're flying something nice and shiny. 
So again, he was basically saying it's getting that balance of what's good for the individual and what's good for your uh, your overall aim. I see. Thank you. And fundamentally, uh, like uh, Clausewitz said, he talks about concentration of force. Uh, and like he says there, um, he gives some statistics as to how to fight the battle uh, based upon uh, numbers. So again, it's almost going back to the opposite of what Clausewitz was doing. He was saying, look, it's not about numbers, it's not about tactics, it's about uh, it's about thinking uh, strategically. Whereas Sun Tzu is actually saying, if you've got this number of people, this is what you do and you're going to win. But again, there's some useful things there. Working out when to attack from different directions, when to attack your opponents, when to split them off, uh, when you actually have to think sensibly about do we uh, do we consider engaging them. And again, we talk about outnumbering um, from Sun Tzu, but actually we could look at capabilities from an EVE perspective. You know what, if you've got ten times the capabilities, you can come in from different directions because you're still going to be stronger. If you've got five times the capabilities, you can just jump in quite easily and attack them and not that anyone's going to take the fight. Um, but then that idea, you know what, if if your opponent outclasses you, make sure you know how to withdraw. And we do that. We talk about aligning. We talk about bounce points. Uh, we talk about who's going to set rolling safes. And fundamentally, finally, it says at the bottom, you know what, if your opponent significantly um, outclasses you, just make sure you can avoid them. Make sure you can cloak up. Make sure you dock. And that's, again, the kind of things we do in EVE. Or run away to the pause for as long as we've got it. Right, and uh, interesting enough, I'd, uh, in my normal class I have deception here, but because we've seen bucket loads of them from uh, the, the nasty people at RVB, uh, I've changed slide 21 to talk about spies. So have a quick read about that. So again, he's saying, you know what, if you're going to throw loads of resources into a war, uh, it's going to affect lots of people. Um, make sure you have your intelligence. Make sure you understand what you're doing. And the best way of doing that is to, uh, is to use spies. Um, you can't sit there with a crystal ball. You need to get people in there. You need to get your intelligence from somewhere. And that goes back to who was it that made the comment about the uh, the doctrines earlier and why it took so long? Me, Theo. Yeah. So again, there was an element of that. Well, they've got spies. We've got spies. If we put the doctrine out too early, uh, then their spies will know what our doctrine is. Not that it makes much of a difference because all the info goes there straight away. Um, so again, it's that it's that balance of do we tip them off too early or do we do everything at the last minute, knowing that it's going to actually add a burden to our pilots trying to get all the ships ready. So what about spies in this war? Silith, talk to me about spies. Have they proved well, no, useful? Have they proved useful to you? Um, I don't actually know of many spies in AV University. I know you guys have been listening in on outcomes. What, what about what about the rest of the guys in here? Have we seen much in the way of uh, in fleets you've been in? Um, effective RVB spies? Affected by, definitely. And sometimes it's nice to hear uh, uh, war targets uh, communications. Yeah, so again, we, we've seen positions, that certainly when I've been in fleets, whereby we've talked about something, uh, and then literally as soon as we've said it, you know that RVB know about it, because they move on. So actually, um, there's, there's a bit of me that thinks, well actually, spies in this war have probably been too effective, because we've probably both avoided fights that would have been enjoyable, because of spies telling us stuff. Well, there's the other aspect of it, which is... When we stand, well, just stand on our ass in a uh, in a station and discuss how we can't beat what they're currently fielding, then we then they do us the favor preemptively to switch down to frigate so we can go out and play. So yes, yes they had some of that. Yeah, there's, there's elements of that, is is we can change the fleet doctrines based on what their spies are saying. Uh, and actually, there's almost an element of, uh, of you can use that as a communications link. Right, whoever the spies are, just tell them that we're coming out in cheap frigs and we'll meet them in such and such. So actually, you can use it to your uh, your benefit. And, uh, and as Reisner says, yeah, um, seconds after we've got a plan, uh, we've been evaded. So again, um, RVB are looking at exactly what um, um, Sun Tzu was saying there. You know what? Um, We've got to use our uh, our intelligence effectively. If the uni is outnumbering us three, four, five to one, we can't afford to fight on even terms because we're going to lose. So we have to use our spies effectively, and they have been using them really, really well. Kudos to whoever they are. Right, and one of the other things he was uh, um, talking about was um, attacking. So uh, again, exactly the same as close of it said, you can defend, but you're not that strong. Uh, you're always going to be, uh, you're gonna, you, so you're going to uh, achieve more attacking. Um, if you have a look at slide 22, that's what Sun Tzu was saying about attacking. 
remember what it's all about. It's all about defeating your opponent. Um, the quicker you get to that point, the more effective you're going to be. Every single fight has to tie into achieving strategic objectives as you're throwing resources away. Again, it's slightly different for us because one of our strategic objectives is for both sides to enjoy themselves. So throwing resources away actually isn't that much of an issue. But is, is physically attacking an opponent the only way we could defeat them in EVE? Nope. nope. You can blue ball them. Yeah. But what, what about if, if we had um, war decked every freighter corporation coming in and out of Old Rat and we used uni resources to buy up everything in all the stations? How would RVB be able to fight? Oh, that's getting in high sec a little bit problematic, I think. Uh, but... I guess it's not a good way to do this uh, because it's maybe not fun for us. Uh, we need to perma um, camp down the Aldrat Gate to attack every freighter, freighter that's coming in, and a Red Bulls Blue can pr- completely avoid this by using NPC corporations for the freighters, uh, and you can't um, declare war on them. So technically, I guess it's not really uh, possible to do this. It no, no, be, you're right. Sorry. You could, you could Sorry. just so you'd sit there and suicide gankers all day if you wanted to. The uni has enough resources to do that. Yeah, so again, uh, there's an element of we could defeat our opponents, but actually not achieve the strategic success we want, which is for everybody to learn and everyone to have fun. Uh, according to this... Um our tactics uh, when I joined if University was completely denying fun to the opponent so uh, the tactics in that days was that we are completely docking up and we're only able to undock if we are on a properly fitted PvP fleet uh, so for that we were completely denying uh, the fun to uh, the opponents but uh, with that we was also denying the fun to ourselves so uh, that was the strategy back in these times, and it may work to a different point, but I think uh, how if university is acting nowadays is way better because we could have more fun. Oh yeah, Damocles says that as well. It's not matching the fun objective. And again, this isn't just stuff to think about when you're in the uni, it's stuff to think about when you move on, is the fact that actually do we only defeat our opponent through, uh, through through killing their ships, or actually their logistics, can, uh, as in their resource logistics as opposed to the logy pilots. Um, can we affect their income? If we uh, if we kill every single one of their miners, they've got no income coming in. Can we deal with that way? Can we buy up everything in their station? Can we stop them getting resources? So there's lots of ways of defeating your opponent other than just uh, burning their spaceships. So, uh, slide 23 is one of Sun Tzu's uh, most famous quotes that uh, most people will have heard of, that idea of uh, knowing your enemy and knowing yourself, um, but it's that idea of, of knowledge. And, 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 and how do we gain that? How do we, uh, how do, we do what Sun Tzu's talking about? Creating doctrine to know ourselves and uh, having spies to know the enemy. Okay, good doctrine, bit of spying, anything else? Formulate standard operating procedure for different situations, so you know how your people will react in advance. Yeah, good training. What else do people think? And again, fundamentally, I think one of the... One of, yeah, understand the player base, as Damocles says. One of the big things I think we tend to forget is, is knowing your ships. It, it's all very well jumping into a doctrine ship, but if you're not comfortable with the ammo, if you're not comfortable with the actual fit, if you don't know your uh, optimals and your fall-offs, if you don't know uh, how to effectively use your ship, that's that element of knowing yourself. You can understand everything about the opponent's ship, but if you don't know how to use your ship effectively, uh, you've already just handicapped yourself. This is my rifle. <laughs> exactly. So let's stick a little bit of it into context. When you have a look at uh, slide 24, what was Clausewitz talking about? Well, when Clausewitz was writing, it was the kind of the Napoleonic Wars. It was a total total war, um, huge massed armies, um, loads of people dying, um, and the objective was to completely destroy your opponent and take over uh, everything they owned. Um, and that's the way. That's where his points came from. And by, by looking at the context he was operating in, you can understand um, where he came up with his thing. So again, selection and maintenance of the aim, work out what you're going for and make sure that everything you do ties into that. Um, make sure you concentrate your forces um, and, and concentrate them against your opponent's key weaknesses and fundamentally it's all about attacking your opponent.
Then you have a look at where uh, Sun Tzu was coming from, and, and his was a different environment. It was uh, it was wars of dynasty, um, so they went on uh, over very short periods, and then another few years later, there'd be a change of dynasty, uh, new wars, uh, but it was much smaller armies meeting in a field, um, and, and again, you would join whichever dynasty you felt appropriate and fight on whatever side, so there was a lot more uh, um, voluntary options, for want of a better phrase, as opposed to some of the Napoleonic wars, where it was that you were fighting for your own existence. Uh, and the objectives were a bit more limited uh, and potentially also because he was coming at it from a Taoist perspective uh, and, and some of the uh, the conceptual thinking he was talking about you know what having that inspired leadership having people that you were willingly follow into battle um, again like uh, like Clausewitz said um, concentration of force was important Sun Tzu definitely identified the importance of spies and we've uh, we've certainly seen the impact that uh, spies can have um, and again uh, like uh, Clausewitz identified, it's all about attacking. You can defend as much as you want, but you're not going to defeat your opponent by f by defending. With that in mind, if you had, you know, applying these contexts, if you were to identify your opponent's center of gravity, being the fact that our review is wanting to have fun, let's say that during the entire war, Uni was allowed to undock. That wouldn't be very fun for them, and that would effectively attack and defeat their entire purpose of the war. Pretty much. So what, 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 where were you going with that? I was just confirming that um, what I was what I was thinking and learning from this. Yeah, no, I mean, fundamentally, and, that, and that, let's face it, that's why this war was arranged. Uh, th this wasn't just RVB going, oh, I'll tell you what, let, let's go and war deck the uni. And there was thought behind it because we can both benefit from it, we can both enjoy it. Um, uh, so when we look at uh, the things that Clausewitz came up with and the things that Sun Tzu came up with, I've kind of put them together on uh, on slide twenty six. If you want to have a look at that, so we've got like we talked about at the start. Um, the strategic objectives, the operational guidance and plans that we think potentially may be lacking, or certainly communication of them may be lacking. And then there's what we do at the uh, tactical level, going out there, um, damping, missiling, lasering, uh, and generally defeating our opponents. So when you look at the lessons that they all came up with, taking the eight lessons with a bit of overlap, um, inspiring leadership. Have we, uh, have we seen some of that so far during the war? Yes, definitely yes. Okay, RVB, I'm guessing you've had the same? Yes, we have. Excellent. Have you also seen potentially uh, weaknesses in the leadership structure that could be improved? Yes. Yes, we have. Yeah, so again, okay. Um, selection and maintenance of the aim? Have we, have we seen that? People thinking about that. I'm guessing that's a no then. Not really. Okay, so you're really quiet there, Rosalind. It must be more clear defined here what we mean by selection and maintenance. Well, what, what, what's the aim of the war? Yes, uh, we're speaking about learning and having fun. So uh, in in these terms, it's definitely working. Yeah, I mean, it's it, we're almost going away from uh, sort of the key um, Sun Tzu and close of its thinking because it's not about defeating the Uni because um, we're not here to destroy RVB and they're not here to destroy the Uni. <clears throat> it's about fun and learning. So as those as um, selection and maintenance of the aim, have we kind of achieved those? Yes. Or are we achieving them? Uh, what about identifying an opponent's center of gravity? Have we done that? I think if we do a whole war, uh, we will uh, not destroy but heavily influenced centers of gravity of two uh, very prominent uh, PVP corporation and high sec as Arabia are. Yeah. Well, in fact, let, let's let's put this war to one side because actually, like we say, the aim of this war is for everybody to have fun and learn. <coughs> How about the aim of the, uh, the the pursuit of happiness war? Would we happily destroy UMAD if we could? Definitely, yes. Okay, so how do we destroy UMAD? What is what is their centre of gravity? How do we make them not fight the uni? I guess we need to ruin their kill board, so uh, push their efficiency below 95%, so that they're getting maybe below 90%, uh, then they will stop taking EVE University. Yeah, that's the thing that tends to come up there is the, the uh, sort of UMAD and the whole pursuit of happiness guys. They're they're all about ISK efficiency. They're all about kill boards. They're all about looking good. Uh, if you can catch two or three of their shiny ships uh, and burn them, all of a sudden this is not going to be a fun war for them. So again, whilst we wouldn't want to destroy RVB because it's fun and entertaining, there are some corporations out there that actually we'd happily dismantle. So when we get into a position where we're fighting them, just have a think about, well, what is their center of gravity? How do I influence them? How can I make sure that my FC is aiming for that? Uh, okay, concentration of force. Have we seen much of that over the past few days? Definitely, yes. 
Have we seen E-Uni's largest ever fleet of 350 odd? Yes. Yep. So it was 330. Yes, Sileth, you uh, you missed the lovely view. 200 was about 170, 180 um, treble cat. Yes. Wasn't online for that one. Well, th- there wasn't a fight. Quite quite understandably, there wasn't a fight uh, because it was a ridiculous. I mean, we had 300 nod in the in the fleet, so, uh, so there, there was no reason for it to, for it to be a flight a fight. That would be stupid. But uh, but it was nice to see. So concentration nice of force. Yeah, concentration of force we've uh, we've certainly seen. Spies, have we seen them being effective? Yes. Definitely, definitely. Some really good spying going on. So if any of you guys have been spying uh, for either organisations, you're, uh, you're doing really well. Um, um, potentially helping fights in some areas, but also potentially stopping people taking a good kick in others. Uh, and have we seen lots of attacking, lots of fighting? Yes. Sorry, Theo, what was that? Yep. Yeah, so, so from a uni perspective, the war is going well, from a fun and learning generally? Yep. Unexpectedly well. Excellent. RVB, you guys still enjoying it? Oh, hell yeah. Everyone's having fun. But not enjoying it enough to come and listen to my lecture apart from you, apparently. <laughs> not that I'll take you personally. only five online right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, right, so fundamentally, um, slide 27, that, that's the end one. You know what? Um, th- this was never um, uh, me going to sit down and tell you all about the art of war. This was about getting you guys thinking about it and, and potentially having to think of some of the bigger issues uh, that go on behind just burning ships in space. Um, so if you've enjoyed it, that's great. Uh, if you haven't enjoyed it, again, let me know. In fact, what I will do is I will link the... Um, now give us a second. There we go. I'll link the uh, I'll link the forum post about the uh, about the class. Um, any feedback, any thoughts, please put them down there, uh, and then I can uh, I can develop it and make it uh, make it better for uh, for uh, next time. Um, again, if you wanna if you happen to be on Twitter, feel free to uh, dive in there and say hi uh, and get some abuse on Twitter. Um, but any questions? No questions at all. Ah, the art of war. The art of war. One hundred two. You know what? I haven't written the art of war. One hundred two. It's on my list of things to do. Actually, I might look at doing um, some of that after uh, after this war's finished. I might look at uh, seeing if I can develop this a little bit further. But I will be running this at different times during the day to uh, to get more people on. And if I may, I really want to add a little more historic perspective on uh, Sun Tzu and Clausewitz, if you allow me to do that. It's yeah, of only course. take three minutes. So, yeah. uh, you know, you really can see the difference between more sublime approach and uh, a little less total minded in uh, Chinese uh, way of doing things and uh, I better say European uh, you know, way of doing things because you do not take uh, this path um, works of Clausewitz and Senzu as uh, some sort of fixating of actual uh, situation uh, or I better say actual mindset of uh, doing wars. It's more uh, some sort of uh, philosophic and in uh, Clausewitz's uh, case more romantic manifesto how he see that war wars must be done because uh, Clausewitz right in a in under very heavy Napoleonic um, situation of complexes because uh, you know uh, Prussia is a really small country and uh, they really sk- tend to see things as to destroy or to survive because uh, there was uh, the situation of Prussia in this time and. You, especially in uh, under heavy influence of, uh, um, I better say, uh, uh, Dwight romanticism, you can really like take it in a different ways. And one more fact: actually, Clausewitz, as a general, do not win war. Maybe <laughs> it's it's not maybe it, it's it's a fact. So take uh, all these uh, books with a grain of uh, of rational mind and uh, it's good when you apply these uh, things to uh, to uh, our current situation and even more broad uh, outside if situation uh, yeah. that's all yeah, I mean, it, it, interesting enough, when you look at some of the great military thinkers, they, they weren't all great military tacticians, because actually, potentially what makes you a good leader doesn't necessarily make you a good strategic thinker. Absolutely right. You do not follow 
uh, somebody else because they are great thinkers. You follow them because they have personality. Yeah, inspirational leadership. Um, Sila, thank you very much for your time. It's good to uh, good to see some uh, um, RVB in here, and again, just give us a different perspective on how things are going from uh, from your side. So I uh, really appreciate you turning up. Thank you very much.